We have the beginning of section two of the work, which is one quarter through of the entire text. I wanted to pause for just a minute to talk a little bit about critical reading and thinking and to remind you of some of the themes and the characters that we've seen so far in Jane Austen's great work. Anytime we do critical reading or thinking, we are operating with four different uh, things at the same time because there are four parts to any critical reading of a work or any critical thinking for that matter. The first of these four parts is called analysis. And in analysis, we break a, a work into its individual parts to look at all the different things that are going on in the work. So for instance, if we were doing science or mathematics or history, we might take apart uh, the Battle of Waterloo, for instance, and we might look at the, the characters involved in the battle, who they were, where they came from, um, their background, their strengths, their weaknesses. In our work, we might take apart, for instance, the various characters and set them aside for a minute. We might say, who is this Darcy character? Who is Elizabeth? Who is Mr. Collins? We might look at the setting, for instance, or we might look at some of the, um, the individual themes or specific words. That's analysis. When we break a work into its individual parts, it's like we're dissecting it, to look at each individual thing. The second part of critical reading, though, is interpretation. And we don't always do these in distinct stages. Frequently we do analysis and interpretation simultaneously. Interpretation is where we work to understand the meaning of the individual parts. Either we're looking to see what the author intended, but sometimes we might find things that the author didn't intend, but that the work actually does mean. Interpretation involves looking at how the individual sections of the work fit together, how they, for instance, how they have meaning in a larger context, perhaps, what the, uh, the colors or the shapes or the symbols might themselves mean as individual things. So, for instance, here, we might take in science. We might say, look at the function of this part of the flower, and what does that individual part of the flower do? That's interpretation, and not just analysis of separating that part of the flower, but, but looking at what that part of the flower actually does in the whole. In interpretation of a literary work, for instance, with Pride and Prejudice, we might look at, again, a character like Darcy and say, well, what does his broodingness and his darkness and his uh, holding himself to a high standard represent? Is he a classic chivalric character? Is he like a knight? Is he, uh, for instance, uh, like a Byronic figure? Is, is there something dark and, and almost scary or threatening about him? Uh, is there something admirable about him? Um, what might he mean when he says this word specifically? Why does he like the eyes of Elizabeth, uh, of all the, the, the parts that he might, might notice about her? What does that say about him? The third stage of critical thinking is synthesis. In synthesis, we have looked at all the individual parts, and now we bring them together to see how they fit together. So, for instance, again, if we were to take an analogy here, if we're doing, say, history or mathematics, in mathematics, we might already have interpreted how a certain function over here works. Now we take that function and we fit it with another function, and we, we come up with a brand new thing, and, uh, the way these two functions work together in mathematics. The same thing happens in literature. When we have looked at individual characters or themes or symbols, and then we understand them in their larger context, then we bring them together. How does Darcy, for instance, fit with Mr. Collins? How does Mr. Collins become a foil, for instance, for Darcy? Or how does Wickham? Lastly, we have evaluation. An evaluation is where we make a judgment about the importance of the theme or the image or even the work as a whole. We might, for instance, think that the theme of tragedy might run through a work, or we might think that the theme of um, the feminine might run through a work. Or we might say, well, how does a specific image, like the shield of Achilles in, in Homer's great work of the Iliad, how does the shield of Achilles stand out as an important image? Or how does the work as a whole fit? Does Jane Austen's work of Pride and Prejudice stand as a landmark in her group of works? Does her work, Pride and Prejudice, stand as a landmark in British literature, British history? We might have to go outside and find out other things in order to make this judgment. So in evaluation, we actually have to put forth our, our, our thought about a certain idea and make an assertion. 
in order to do this, we have to do certain things. We ask questions about the text from the very beginning. We ask questions, why does this occur? What is this character doing? What is he thinking? What is he saying? Why do they do this? And write those questions down so we can come back to them. The second thing that we do is that those questions then are designed to guide us towards what's important and what's unimportant in the text. If, for instance, we're asking questions about what makes a good man, then everything that doesn't have to do with that might be something we put aside, even though it might be funny, it might not be important to finding out the question of what makes a good man. In our case, what makes a good marriage? Anything that doesn't have to do with that might not be something we want to focus on. So it guides us to what's important and what's unimportant in a text. After that, we infer meaning from the important images. Once we've got an idea of things that contribute to a good marriage, for instance, then we start inferring meaning. Does a good marriage mean mere convenience, like with Charlotte and Collins? Does a good marriage mean bickering all the time, like Mr. and Mrs. Bennett? Does a good marriage involve flightiness and shallowness? Does a good marriage mean honor? All those different things are things that we begin to infer about the meaning of these images. And the last thing we do is we support our inferences and judgments with actual citations from the text. It's like we're, um, we're detectives and we're looking for evidence that will support a thesis or an idea or judgment we're making. So thinking about our work so far, we've got the themes, for instance, of enlightenment, we've got the themes of the happy marriage, we've got themes even of the dragon and the hero that are going on in this work so far, what makes a good man, and, and you have to begin asking yourself, how do the various scenes that we've seen so far contribute to these themes? How do they fit into the themes, for instance, of the, 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 the hero or the, the good marriage? Also, how do various characters play as foils to one another? How is Charlotte a foil to Elizabeth, for instance? How is Jane a foil to Elizabeth? How does Elizabeth see in her mother a, a foil, something that she doesn't want to be? Similarly, how does Darcy compare to Collins? How does Darcy compare to Mr. Wickham? How does Darcy compare to Mr. Bingley? So as we go through the text, I encourage you to ask these sort of questions. You can either write them in your text, or you can write them on a separate piece of paper, you can write them somewhere on your computer if you wish to, or you can tap and make a note if you wish to on your iBook. One way or the other, you're going to come back to these questions later on, not just to understand the text, but also to be able to make some judgment about it and eventually to be able to write about the text itself.